welcome ravi hi shri it's um it's your first lit fest i'm guessing and you just told me that uh, the real launch of the book is at jaipur so thanks for uh, coming here and doing this with us well, and it's also my first lit fest i've actually never been on stage before so thank you well i'm glad uh, this brought us back together because it's been over a year and a half uh, it has. since since we met and it has it's a great joy and honor to be here at the bangalore lit fest and that to on stage listening at from the other side thank you i um this this is very different from your uh, previous book which was conquering the chaos and what struck me was uh, there is uh, there's a there's a red light and a green light and there's a dinosaur on the cover <laughs> uh, do you want to um, start by telling us the story behind the cover and maybe also uh, what is what the heck do i do with my life all about one of the things i've learned working with publishers is that you let them make all the important decisions so this is not the cover i picked but this is the cover they assured me is what would uh, catch the eyes of audience and sell books so but you, yeah there is a dinosaur if you look carefully in the middle the book comes out in about another 2 weeks or so um so um yeah so the central idea of this book is look this 21st century that we're in is extraordinary for uh, the rate of change uh, that we're living through and in this century the the amount of change we experience is going to be more than in all of human history and usually when you go through such an amount of change it creates what's called an adaptation challenge many people can't adapt and they'll struggle some will and they'll flourish and to make the point i use the uh, uh, example of dinosaurs and dinosaur extinction uh, for the adaptation challenge as you know they didn't make it uh, an early shrew like mammal did make it and we're all the happy result of that and so the question here is are you going to be a dinosaur or a mammal and i make the case that uh, adaptation is actually a rather specific set of things it's about a mindset a set of skills and a set of strategies that allow you to navigate all this chaos and turbulence and then the rest of the book goes on to unpack some of these ideas and and we'll jump into that i mean i i did have the pleasure of reading the book and and really enjoyed it uh, and that's how i've i've come prepared with uh, with some questions uh <laughs> you talked about adaptation and uh, you know uh, agile staying relevant and i think uh you also start off the book by saying uh, you know it's very different from uh, what you set out to write because uh, the world has changed uh, and you talked about some of that just now as well um what have you used uh, through your uh, you know sort of to to anchor yourself through all the changes and challenges that you've had to face ravi well first of all i think my generation and those of us who are part of that generation in retrospect had it easy because the rate of change was modest and generally the trends were tailwinds and upwards i think things are going to be a lot more challenging now um and so if if i look back and say what helped me not just anchor but navigate lots of these changes um i'd point you to um something i write about in the very first chapter itself which is um the idea of what are called intangible assets so most of us think about um assets as capital wealth you know your home other assets money etc and we're reasonable stewards of it but it turns out that if you're going to be resilient and survive all these shocks and be able to make the necessary transitions through our life there are a whole host of other assets which are really important for instance um your networks your family uh, your marriage your uh, reputation professional reputation um your belief system your spirituality all these things your health mm-hmm. most importantly now, all these things make a profound difference to your ability to withstand weather shocks and also make transitions so for instance people look at me and say how have you done all these different things particularly in these last 10 years till then it was a fairly conventional life but in these 10 years there's been an unusual amount of experimentation and i've gone on to work in private sector public sector social sector how did you do it well it's because i think more intentionally than most people i have paid attention to these intangible assets and made sure that they were cultivated etc so that's chapter 1 and and how did some of that realization really 
come through? I mean, was it I, I, clearly it was it was through time, but uh, how is how is that uh, formed uh, for you? Mostly, you rationalize after the fact. Yeah. So one of the reasons uh, this book has taken ten years to write, and it's not because I was uh, wasn't diligent and didn't try and sit down every morning to, you know, write the obligatory page or whatever. It's because I had to actually experiment my way to the answers. Okay, so this is in that sense a very deeply experiential book. There's nothing here that I haven't tried, tested, and found useful myself. It's a lot about the mistakes that I made or things I tried that didn't work out. So this idea of intangible assets is first, firstly, I'm not the inventor of it. It's actually Linda Grattan. Yeah. But um, it's something I realized, ah, that's exactly what I've been doing. And I better do this much more consciously than I have been. And uh, I think the other thing that resonated really well for me in the book itself was uh, how you, you narrate a lot of these uh, with, of course, your own experiences, uh, but then also put in a fair bit of content on reflection. Uh, I was curious uh, again as you, um, you know, uh, started to think about the book. Uh, I, th I thought that was really interesting and uh, and valuable for a reader. Uh, tell us a little about that uh, that part of the journey, Ravi. Look, so one of the problems with writing a book like this is, and I acknowledge this in the preface itself, everything important about how to think about life and success and failure and all these things has been written yep. many times before and much better than I have. So what is it that you're saying that's new? The second thing is each life is different. Each person's experience is unique. So you can't really give a formula or recipe or anything. So I said, look, the approach I'm going to take is essentially to put forward provocative ideas. And I don't care whether the reader agrees or disagrees, okay. as long as they, it gets them to start thinking. The biggest issue I see today um, is, you know, partly I agree with what Nitin was saying at one o'clock is people don't read anymore, but that people don't think and make intentional or deliberate choices. Too many people, including, you know, the, the intellectual elite, live li their lives like pieces of driftwood, just carried along by a fast moving current of life. And what I want to do through this book and all the videos, et cetera, that will eventually accompany it is simply get people to start thinking about these kinds of choices. So for instance, I bring in fairly early a rather dramatic idea called societal collapse, which is the place where you live. Do you think it could become like Syria? Now you may think that's a really bizarre question. These things happen in Africa or South America, they don't happen here, but they could. And so the idea is not whether you agree that it's possible, probable or not, but get you to think. Got it. And I, yeah, I did want to. And that's why the reflection questions right. are there, right. so that somebody can actually apply uh, what they've read to their own life. And there's also the, you know, the you, you mentioned three three big waves uh, that uh, that you've encountered uh, as uh, you know through your uh, through the career and, and and all the work that you've been doing. Uh, you talk about globalization. You talk about the internet uh, and about uh, financialization. And, uh, and you also offer possibilities for what the next waves uh, really could be. Uh, the question, I guess, would love to hear, sort of hear a little more about what the, what's your thinking there, but also uh, at a personal level, if you were to, uh, you know, do it all again, what would you pick and what, what might you do differently? Yeah, one of the things that strikes me is a lot of what we sort of claim as success is actually just blind luck, okay? It's just being in the right place at the right time. And there's a rising tide that lifts lots of lives and your little boat is one of them. And so I, in that particular yeah. um, chapter, I reflected on the fact about how lucky I've been in these 50 odd years, 59 years, I've had three tides. So the whole, you know, internet, then globalization, and I, you know, my, my career is essentially one of, that has benefited from both and then financialization. The world has become incredibly more financialized. And so I had these three tides. So the question is, what's the next tide and how do you make sure you intercept that? And since you asked the question, I think the next one is all about the green economy. I think it is rapidly moving to center stage in our lives, in the agenda of companies, of countries, etc. And there's so much that is to be done and that's going to throw up so, so much opportunity. So if you think about having to decarbonize the world and what it means. It's not just energy. 
We have to invent completely new ways of making materials, whether it's green steel or green glass. You have to think about how we grow and distribute food that is much more sustainable. Right. And all this is going to require innovation and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And that's going to create, as Larry Fink of BlackRock said just a couple of weeks ago, the next 1,000 unicorns are likely to come from the green economy. So the advice this afternoon is go find a way to intercept the green economy. And there's also the aspect around, um, you know, and related, I guess, to the internet, uh, AI and, and how that's uh, taking over. And I know, um, you know, our education system is not geared uh, towards uh, being more human. It's, it's teaching us things that machines can do. Yeah. Uh, how do you see all that? Uh, playing out and I guess how do we get uh, how do we get more human and less AI <laughs> <laughs> so that's lots of, that you can say about because also AI. if you look at the yeah, you, you talked about this as well the recent uh, the chess game as well right and um, Magnus really doing human moves and not not AI moves I think there's a lot of people us who are fairly concerned about the impact of AI on the world the impact of AI on jobs the the Terminator um, scenario, oh, lots and lots of different things. Um, here, I'm not, I don't really unpack all that. Here, mm -hmm. I focus on what can you do as an individual in the age of AI? And the, the short answer is become more, try and be more human and don't try to outrun the machines. Okay, that's a losing proposition. And the, there's a giant problem today because the education system in every country, it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in the US, some Euro, part of Europe or India, is designed for a world that simply doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, our education system even today is designed for a world that is stable and predictable, where information access is hard, which is why you need to mug up a lot and memorize a lot of True. things for a world in which it is presumed that the demand for skills is greater than the supply of skills. So anybody who completes an education is likely to get a job. None of these things are true anymore. What matters today is a whole variety of different skills, right? Such as problem solving, um, the ability to lead, inspire others to go get something done. Um, all the soft qualities of communication, collaboration, creativity, all these things matter more. In fact, I refer, I, there's a Google research project uh, called Project Oxygen. And they went back and used data to see who are all the people who've done spectacularly well at Google. And it turns out not to be the techies. It turns out not to be the techies. It's people who have all these soft skills. And none of this is taught in the education system. So the, the issue for us is how do we learn to be more human? And I was talking to Sri about Magnus Carlsen, who just, uh, you know, retained the World Chess Championship. And his opponent, who was spectacular, had, uh, you know, was working with uh, DeepMind and a whole array of these algorithmic gurus. And he crushed him. And afterwards, there's this Wall Street Journal interview. And he says, I just decided to play my game, be more human and be more unpredictable, more creative, and the computer couldn't keep up. So I think this is the hope for all of us. And so in that chapter, I talk about what does it mean to be much more human and stop trying to play a race you simply can't win. And there's a, there's a few things and I, I'd, I'd like to jump from, uh, you know, sort of, I guess, one chapter to another at some level also because uh, we did realize that uh, not everyone's uh, ha obviously had a chance to read the book. So I uh, thought it'd be good to uh, unpack a few things. Uh, I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of knowing you now for uh, close to a decade. Uh, I've seen you from, you know, help, helping Uniteds get off the ground, uh, launching social venture partners in India. And then of course, Infosys, Bank of Baroda, uh, and then your work with UNICEF, Rockefeller Foundation. There's a lot that that's going on. And uh, what uh, resonated was you talk about this uh, portfolio approach to life. Um, tell us more about, uh, and that's, I guess, it's, it's formed for you uh, more recently and not, and obviously prior to that, it was largely, I guess, uh, you know, Cummins, Microsoft and, and uh, yeah. Uh, so that's yeah, it. tell us about, um, and of course now uh, with, with all the work that you do at, uh, at Game and, and in the book, you talk about how we need to think about our, uh, our careers as a, as a portfolio approach uh, of, uh, of projects while, you know, while also emphasizing that, you know, obviously it's, all, it's, it's important to, uh, to leave a legacy and not, uh, not really live uh, year on year. 
Uh, tell us more, Ravi. Phew, that's a lot. That's the whole book. So my, my whole premise here. I do my homework. So one of the premises here actually is that the idea of a job and a career is, is irre becoming irrelevant and almost obsolete. The idea of a job as a stable contract between an employer and an individual, right. where which is long-term stable in, a in return for good pay and advancement, you, you get commitment and loyalty, that's over. Okay, it's going to be relevant for a smaller and smaller population all over the world. And the reasons for this, you know, part of it is the world is becoming much more dynamic. So companies are becoming much more flexible in their labor arrangements, right? So much more subcontracting, much greater use of consultants, yeah, gig, work, gig work, all that sort of stuff. That got a huge boost during the pandemic because we all discovered remote work is possible yeah. and often it's superior. So this has got everybody thinking about how do I tap into talent everywhere? Mm -hmm. So this I, the idea of jobs, as many of us knew it, I think is fading away. And the sooner, faster, most of us embrace that reality and say, look, how I may need it as a springboard to what I do in life, as my first experience where I learned something, I see Harshita nodding. But as soon as possible, I'm going to try and be an entrepreneur or I'm going to become self-employed. I'm going to become a freelancer and find a way to monetize things that I am good at and love mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. And usually once you go down that path, you discover that your life, your work life resembles a, a, a portfolio or a collection of projects. And these projects are different kinds of things. Some things you, you, know, you get paid for. So I might serve on a board and I get paid some money for that, or I might do some consulting and get paid for it. Other things I do because I enjoy it. I, I, you know, I'm learning something. I do it for impact or whatever. So you, as, rather than look as we did for everything from a job, and a job gives us everything actually. It gives you income, it gives you community, it gives you the opportunity to learn the satisfaction of achievement. Now you have to have different things that, you know, uh, it's like a thali that you assemble. And so you have to very intentionally go about assembling this portfolio. And also the portfolio changes over time. So what I started with in 2011, 12, 11, 12, yeah. and what it is today in 21 is quite different. So I think the more we can quickly, we can grasp this idea. And in the beginning, it's terrifying. Okay, what? No job. I have to learn to stand on my own feet. How risky. Gradually, as you get into it, you not gradually, quickly, you realize this is actually less risky than working for some moronic manager who, you know, who may, whose views of you and assessment of you <laughs> can change rapidly. Okay, here at least you're much more in control of your life. Okay, and so the risks are lower, the payoff is better. And so I don't know many people who would want to go back to full-time employment. Um, so there's a whole chapter on practically how do you accomplish this, okay? Because it's not easy to sit in a chair and dream up what projects am I going to do? You have to feel your way to your future. It's very experiential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think chapter seven is the one to go to. Okay. And um, I think there's also the fact that, uh, you know, the world is unforgiving. And uh, how do you deal with failure? How do you deal with uh, uh, you know, how do you pick up pieces after failure? And from your own experience, you know, how you dealt with that and how you navigated failure away? I think to talk about failure, you also have to talk about failure. You have to talk about its opposite, which we think means success. And so, again, I devote quite a bit of time to, um, you know, the idea of success. And the truth is, I did for the longest part of my life, and I suspect many people live most of our lives according to somebody else's definition of success, mm -hmm. either society or you know, someone else, parents. Um, and the problem with that is it always leads to disappointment because you either don't achieve your goals or somebody else achieved even more or, and so forth. And, but that to me isn't really failure. That is just a, a need to go back and at least in the second half of your life, begin to redefine success um, you know, in more real terms, which are more authentic. The real issue um, in, is confusing failure and setbacks. Mm -hmm. So if you look, I give the metaphor, the, the analogy actually of a child learning to walk. 
And a child learning to walk, as we've all seen, repeatedly stumbles and falls before eventually uh, succeeding. Mm -hmm. You don't, the child never looks at that as failure. It's just an integral part of, True. of learning. True. And so, uh, you know, so I think setbacks of this nature are essential. They're good things. I think what really is problematic is when life hurls some catastrophic thunderbolt at you. You know, you lose all your, you lose your job, your income, your assets or health or loved one or, or the entire family like CDS, you know, that I'm thinking about uh, General yeah. Rawat's daughter, everybody wiped out yeah, all at yeah. once. So when it, when this sort of thing happens, how do you cope with it? I mean, to me, that feels really the most daunting challenge. And unfortunately, I'm mm -hmm. predicting in the book mm -hmm. that we'll see a lot more of these types of issues uh, strike us because of the nature of the world. And for that, you have to go back to my opening comment on intangible assets. Yeah. That is, if you have other things, if you've developed a strong spiritual life, mm. if you've got friends and networks, if you have a strong family, uh, if you've got a built a reputation and networks, your ability to withstand these kinds of shocks and fa failures and setbacks, et cetera, is far superior. And uh, I dwell a lot on how do you make sure that you remain lucky. I won't say more about that because I want somebody to read the book. <laughs> but, but you know, no, as you I talk look, about serendipity as well in, in multiple yeah. places, right? Yeah, yeah there, there is, is a lot of serendipity yeah. and there is a, just a whole lot of good luck. Uh, you talked earlier in the conversation about uh, you know, uh, places like Syria and, and, and what would happen. So I guess the question related to that is um, how important is it uh, where we live? And I'm guessing, you know, some of this has played out much more so now uh, over the past 18 months with the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, what and, do you think you about know, that? I, I don't know how many of you were here for the one o'clock se uh, session with, yeah, with Josie, Josie and Nitin, yeah. where he talked about the deep state. Not many were there. But it makes you kind of think about the future of our country. And right. if I had a choice, would I want to live here? At least that session did. Yeah. So I had a mentor called John McLaughlin, who in 1990, he said, look, if I had to relive my life, I'd first pick the place where I want to live and then find out what I can do here. And at that time, I didn't pay much attention, but I think it's very, very sound advice. So I again, uh, dwell quite a bit on this choice and being intentional about it uh, rather than just accidentally ending up in Bangalore or whatever. Right. And uh, one of the most influential um, people in my recent life intellectually has been a, a guy called Ned Phelps. And Ned, yeah. as you know, won a Nobel Prize for economics. And his work looks at why do some societies, some countries suddenly become very prosperous? So he looks at why did the Industrial Revolution happen, for instance, in Britain in the uh, 18th century, rather than in more, you know, at that time, more prosperous Spain or sure. Italy or whatever. Sure. Why did this, they lose the plot and then America take the lead. And now why is America losing dynamism and China seems to be surging? And he comes to a very, very cr critical point, which he calls dynamism. And he says the source of dynamism in a society is its values and culture. Mod and he specifically talks about modern values. Mm -hmm. And in modern values, he says, oh, simple things like, what is this society's attitude towards risk-taking? Okay, do they encourage a young person to take risk or do they try and beat the idea out of them? Then who is allowed to take risk or have ideas? Do you have to belong to some in-group, for instance? Do you have to be male or Hindu sure. or from IIT to, in order to start a business yeah. or can you be yeah. anybody? Um, the idea of equality and justice, etc. So mm -hmm. these modern values, he, he says, are the source of dynamism, which is why I think it's so difficult to copy paste a Bangalore or Silicon like, Valley well, anywhere else. Yeah. And so I say, look, look at, you know, this society and decide whether it has embraced to a reasonable degree modern values. And I think that's why Bangalore is such a special place. Yeah. And that's why a place like BIC is so special True. and an event like BLF is so special because it allows us to come together. And what happens if you don't have modern values is people are unable to come together to solve important problems, okay? And that's what you see happening across India. So no, the trust levels are so low 
that no matter if whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, people will resist it because they don't trust. And those societies go like Syria and Mali and so on and so forth. And if you think it can't happen here, think again, because again, you look at January 6th and the storming of Capitol Hill, um, the Capitol, sorry, um, in Washington, and you realize we're living at a time where the unthinkable could happen anywhere with a rapidity that you cannot fathom. So what do you do about that? Again, there's a whole sort of point of view on it. Got it. Um, we'll stop and maybe ask uh, folks in the audience if they've got questions. If you have a question, you could come up to the mic here. Uh, Ravi, you gave us two uh, almost contrary viewpoints. One about uh, being intentional about so many things. But you did mention three, four times about the importance of luck and serendipity, right? So what do we have to be intentional about? And uh, I have a counter you know, point here, which is that if, if serendipity and luck are so important, are in the values that we should be, I don't know, teaching our kids or imbibing ourselves, you know, curiosity and being able to tinker with multiple things. Is that how to live a better life? Or is it, you know, truly being intentional? Because if you look at your incredibly successful career, did you think you would go to Harvard or did you think, were you intentional about working with Bill Gates and building Microsoft into the behemoth it is in India? Were you intentional about starting a venture capital firm? Probably not, right? So where is intentionality and 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 where is the rest of it? Very meta question. I'm sorry. Oh my God, there's a that's a really <laughs> it's a really difficult question. So um, I think there are things that we're in somewhat in control of, and those are, for instance, the decision to work really hard. I came to that decision uh, fairly early because. Again, I admit it in my book, in school, I wasn't the brightest kid in the class. So I said, but I want to succeed. I had a very strong drive to succeed. So I'm going to work harder than everybody else. I think you can, can and must be intentional about the kind of person you choose to be. Okay. Now, in terms of what you end up doing or how things play out, I think that's where effort and intention meet randomness or um, you know, chance. And so there's no way of predicting what you actually will end up doing. So, um, you know, I talk about leaving Microsoft in 2011. There were a whole bunch of things I tried to do. Most of them didn't work out. What you see today is only what did work out, okay? Yeah. And people say, oh, that's reasonably successful. But behind the success was a long list of experiments, tinkering <laughs> that didn't quite play out. And of course I encourage tons of experimentation, but not randomness, mm. okay? So again, I talk about intentional experiments. So I, in fact, go back and talk about Mahatma Gandhi and his intentional experiments, which he calls my experiments with truth to figure out a the kind of person he wanted to be and his value system and also what he eventually wanted to do. I think that's a pretty good uh, model, but you never know how exactly it's going to play out and manifest. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot more in the book, though. Hi, sir. sir. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. You did mention Carlson, uh, the chess champ, the recent one. And I was just going through uh, uh, Vishwanathan Anand versus Carlson. There's a gap of 20 years, right? And Carlson won uh, recently twice a world champion. One was in India and Chennai. Subsequently, uh, um, Anand was mentioning one of his uh, uh, word that difference between me and Carlson. Carlson was a computerized uh, practice uh, person in terms of chess, right? I was more of a practice with the conventional way, which was taught by his uh, mom. And uh, see, there is a, definitely a gap, generation gap. There's a shift happening. And uh, in your book, if I, you articulated many things about the culture, X, Y, Z, but how, what is the uh, today's generation? If you look at India has around 60 to 70% of uh, less than 40 years age, uh, things are getting changed fast. What exactly, uh, you know, the young generation or even middle age, what they have to focus? You did mention also uh, self-employment or you did mention uh, luck one part. Uh, on the whole, what is your message to the community uh, in terms of uh, learning? Because, you know, yesterday's technology doesn't hold today. Yeah. 
if i'm right and my question is right or not i don't know but i felt somewhere else that you know there is a motivational factors you did also mention uh, china is overpowering uh, us in terms of uh, uh, if you look at the culture values and exposure factors but do they sustain we'll get yeah. the question out first yeah. ahead, i think you've asked many good questions in one so i'll just pick up one so one of the interesting questions for, that all of us uh, have to try and answer and certainly young people is what are the skills that are really yeah. important okay as you said things move fast and the, the, within 20 years it's a whole it's multi, many generations and you know today people say oh well you should all go learn coding and except that now we are all entering this low code no, no code, code yeah. environments and you know it's so, software doesn't need uh, much um, human interaction or human development so what really matters and i say look the things that matter are actually what are called meta skills one of the meta skills is learning agility which is if you're put into a situation that you've never encountered before mm -hmm. how do you make sense of it learn quickly and figure out what to do, what is to be done another one is your um, people skills as it turns out as the world is getting more technology intensive more automated uh the the more important human skills and interactions are becoming more and more of our problems require us to work collaboratively together to solve them almost all the jobs which can be done individually are exactly the ones that can be automated okay so your people skills become very important leadership i said is the defining skill for success in the 21st century and then entrepreneurship so i think it's a but unfortunately as you can see very few of these things are actually taught in the educational system in schools or colleges so much of my work with unicef and is how do we help a whole generation of young people learn these skills outside the classroom anyway thank you there's much more in the book but brilliant question yeah, yeah. thanks Excellent. Thank i think you. we've uh, i wanted to understand this piece about experimentation but creating a safe environment which allows us to <clears throat> experiment non judgmental and what's been that is there a take on that in your book or do you have something that you'd like to share because i think that's a critical piece if we don't have a safe environment and we're being continuously judged it's very hard yeah so i think a safe environment is good but i also refer to um, something called the monkey law and the monkey law says that you never give up one vine before you've already caught hold of another vine too many p and that that's a example of being too safe too many people say i'm not going to give give this up until i have some my next and as a result it actually never let go okay if you just wait for perfect safety etc what you need is perhaps some of those intangible assets like a supportive family at um you know a good network etc which will encourage you rather than discourage you uh but other than that the the safety net yeah no but the risk of not doing is greater than the risk of doing and failing okay, okay so there's it's not a risk free thing right. on so, that note ravi we'll wrap this conversation up uh thank you so much for being at the bangalore literature festival thank you thank you shree and as he said i'm sorry the book wasn't available for today but it soon will be and uh do do not only read it but also review it critically on amazon or anywhere thank you so much